Sarah, you're a whiner. You just always think you're in pain. You're just way too sensitive. And we'll just go about our work and our lives as if that pain an injured part doesn't even exist. And then, if we have that kind of contract to leave ourselves when we're experiencing pain, then everything that Sharon and I are talking about can be, like, radically upsetting. Cue music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. I've brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. Thank you for joining us here on the Autoimmune Hour with Sharon Saylor. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio. Join the Autoimmune Hours Courage Club. Sign up now at understandingautoimmune.com. Now, back to your host, Sharon Saylor. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com, and I'm just in the process of recentering myself because I started a lovely interview with my dear, dear friend, Sarah Payton, who's on the show tonight. Yee! Yippee! And I forgot to hit record, guys. <laughs> so we're going to take take two. And uh, let me tell you about Sarah. She's one of the all-time favorite guests. We get comments and and requests for Sarah to be back on. And I'm so excited that she's back on tonight. And like I said, so excited. I forgot to hit record. So here we go again. Take two. And let me tell you, Sarah is a certified trainer of nonviolent communication. And she's a neuroscience educator. And she integrates brain science and the use of resonant language to awaken and sustain self-compassion, particularly in the face of difficult issues such as self-condemnation or self-disgust and self-sabotage. And she teaches and lectures internationally and is the author of Your Resonant Self book series, which includes a wonderful workbook. And she is also the co-author alongside Roxy Manning for the Anti-Racist Heart, a self-compassion and activist handbook. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks for being on the show and apologize for the the false start there. (laughs) Oh, it's just wonderful to be with you, Sharon. I love it. So I'm I'm perfectly happy. Uh, We're going to talk about fascia tonight, and I'm so excited and interested in this topic because About three years ago, I was introduced to someone who does fascial release, and that's when I first really understood the word, what is your fascia? So let me give a quick little brief understanding of it from the science of Sharon, that fascia and your lymph system, they work together and they work in tandem to improve like things like mobility and reduce pain and flush out your toxins. And maybe you're more familiar with your lymph system, that's your little lymph nodes all around your body, and oftentimes your doctors will palpate them to find out if you have an infection or something like that and your fascia works to support that and it's a support system for throughout your whole body it keeps us actively moving and in both our nervous system and our muscular system so sarah came to me recently and she talked about the fascia and what if it had unconscious contracts and other things about the fascia so sarah intrigued me sarah let's talk about fascia a little bit what's your understanding about fascia that funny film that surrounds the muscles. It's so cool that you're talking about the lymph system too. I'm just imagining how it's mobility and fluidity in there, surrounding the muscles, supporting the muscles, connecting them to the bones, creating the ligaments. Just It's just such good stuff in our bodies. And I had this moment of revelation where I've been w- working with somebody who does, instead of myofascial release, which sounds a little more gentle than what I've been getting. I've been getting trigger point therapy, which is intense. (laughs) But also releases the fascia. So my chiropractor was working on me and he was like, Sarah, sometimes I just want to say to you, just let go, God damn it. And I was like, (laughs) We need those people in our lives. (laughs) I was lying there on the table and I thought, this is not the way Sarah Payton talks to people. So I wonder what Sarah Payton would say to the fascia. I wonder what it is that's hanging on and sticking in here that keeps me so tense. 
And, and I thought, well, I'll go home and think about it because I don't know the answer to this question. And I went home and I was thinking about it. And I was like, I wonder if what he's talking about is a tension in my fascia that's just constant. And if there's a tension in my fascia, what happens if I talk to it? Because as you and I and our audience know, we spent a lot of time talking to different cells in our body, but I had never before had a conversation with my fascia. So I thought, okay, I'm going to start working with this. And that's the, that was the beginning. You asked me what's fashion, but I started into our origin story here for our show. What's fascinating to me when you said that, I did not know that story. I had a doctor, this was years ago, but it was so true. But now I understand it was a fascia. He was working with my back and he was commenting, if it wasn't for stress, you'd have no muscles at all. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, A, he was right. I was under a lot of stress at the time. So maybe he was right. But B, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm sure it was the fascia had just constricted. It's a protection thing that I, as, as I understand it, oftentimes it constricts to protect us, whether it's useful or not. It, that's another story. Yeah. And so put this together, this experience of contemplating my fascia and the protective stuff that's, yes. And then I was been working with an Alexander Technique teacher and been working with her since the beginning of the pandemic. And one of the things that she always talks about is what does your body think it's supposed to be doing? There's all kinds of stories we're told about how we're supposed to have a certain posture. And the kind of things that we're told are actually really counterproductive to us having a fluid responsive fascial system that can help our lymph move fully and easily through our body and, and keep moving and responding and pumping in response to blood flow. Just such a beautiful system that we live within. But we get told, pull your shoulders back. And when you start deliberately trying to pull your shoulders back, one of the things that happens is it tightens all the way down your back and all of a sudden your lungs your lungs are trying to work in there and there's no room for them to expand the little hinge in the back along the spine that lets the ribs move and flow in response to the breath all of a sudden that's all turned off so she had been talking to me and i've been thinking about the stories we live within what are the stories that we live in and how are we making those stories into contracts that could then be released that would allow us to have that fluidity and that ease? So there I am, working for three years with my Alexander Technique teacher, who keeps saying, hey, Sherry, your shoulders are up around your ears. There's really no need for them to be up there. And I would, I would breathe into them. I would bring them down. They would fall three or four inches. And the next time I stopped thinking about it, they'd be up around my ears again. So I was like, okay, if I'm working with stories and fascia and unconscious contracts, what's the story here? What's happening with my shoulders? Why are they going up toward my ears? And as I felt into that, it felt like there were marionette strings attached to the tops of my bones. And I was like, marionette strings? Who am I dancing as a puppet for? And I was like, it must be my mom. Now my mom, lovely person, died about 10 years ago. If I'm still dancing to my mom's marionette strings, it's, it's a useless action. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But <laughs> stories from childhood on tend to keep us moving in specific ways. So I, was, so I said, okay, if this is an unconscious contract, I will dance to my, I will be my the marionette on my mother's puppet strings. I will do this in order to, and our audience will remember how important that in order to is, we never know what it is until we start to reach in and feel it. I was like, I will dance as a puppet on my mother's strings in order to... And the audience may remember that my mom had dissociative identity disorder. So it was really important that I cooperate with her in order to keep her stable and so that she would not shift her personas and so that I would continue to have a mother. So it's like, I'll dance to my mom as a puppet on my mom's strings in order to keep her stable. 
And in order to make sure that everything happens in a way that she expects so that she just stays with me so that I get to have a mom. And, and I was like, okay, good vow, good vow from when, from childhood. Do I still need it now, now that she's dead? Do I still need it? Maybe did I still need it after I was 18 years old and left her home? And I was like, no, obviously I don't need this anymore. Shoulders. I'm going to let go of those puppet strings. I release you from this vow. I revoke this contract. My shoulders came down and they haven't been like when I forget, they still stay down. They're not, they're not pulling up anymore. And in both of these stories about my chiropractor and about my work with my, with my puppet strings, I think one of the things that's really hitting home in this moment is how much, how much I, I've been noticing that just telling myself to do something is not enough. That there needs to be a respect for the thing I'm doing. And then that warm curiosity about what its root is. Why am I doing this thing? And then that consensual release. Am I ready to release? And then when I'm ready to release, whoo, my body changes. So I just love the unconscious contract process. And it's fascinating how, in this case, it was probably the constriction of the fascia that was continuing to go back into a position that it was used to and it felt safe in, even though it wasn't a helpful or healthy position for the body to maintain. Right, right. And then to come back to your idea of protection, because a lot of people might, I think, have resonated with you when you said that, that we tighten our fascia in order to be ready to deal with any blows that are going to be coming our way. Emotional blows, shaming blows, physical blows, financial blows, car accident blows, all of those blows that come and, and are part of our lives. Explain to the audience, though, about the difference between the muscles and the fascia. I think oftentimes when you say we tighten up, I don't think people realize that most people would go, oh, I just tightened up my muscles. But let's talk about what fascia does that keeps us there versus just a quick response of tightening my arms next to my chest. It turns out, and this is what I started to discover when I started to research fascia as a result of these contemplations, I discovered that our fascia actually has the structure that can hold a long-term position where our muscles don't. If we were relying on our muscles to hold the long-term position, they wouldn't be able to do it. They would fatigue and then our body would relax. But the fascia can hold forever, I think. <laughs> That's a long time. Very long time. <laughs> we'll long, say figuratively, if not literally. <laughs> as long as we're alive, at any rate, the fascia can grab and hold on. And so it's our postural, structural support. Even more than our bones are, even more than our muscles are, the fascia is what's doing, doing the thing to keep us in our habitual patterns. Yeah, I know I told you a story about a client that I saw pre-pandemic and I used to see them in person. And I remember I hadn't seen them in a while and I was in their hometown and I, we agreed to meet. And when they walked through the door, my first thought was, I remember them taller. <laughs> I know that's a weird thing to remember, but I did. And then as we were talking and chatting, the story that I was hearing was about how life had beaten them down and they were just feeling really penned in and all sorts of words about smallness and constriction. And I didn't know about fascia then, but I'm really seeing the correlation here as we talk, because as we were chatting about some of the things that were beating them down and letting them explore some ways to change what was happening, you could actually see them grow before your eyes. Oh. Now, I don't remember exactly if they got to the height I remembered them at, but when they left, I, as they walked through the door, you could say they were actually physically taller. And I'm sure it was a conversation that unbeknownst to either of us, we were having with the fascia. Oh, that's so wonderful. And it really speaks to the importance of warm accompaniment, that our bodies need warm accompaniment with the, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, that we really need 
people to be with us and that then so much can change so much can release we can we can be be back to our regular height yeah I'm not sure they were ever aware of their, their regular height, but they did have a, more of a jolly tone to their voice and the whole thing. So I think it's great. But it's fascinating to me is about the self-talks we might have on ourselves, whether we're feeling, I'll put in air quotes, down on ourselves. Are we really pushing ourselves down or pushing ourselves in? Or I'm just thinking of all the kinds of ways we use language. Yeah. That might be describing exactly what our, we're doing. <laughs> yes, yes. All of the metaphors for how we feel and what it's like to be alive and what it's like to live our lives, our difficult and stressful lives or our moments of joy and happiness lives. What an interesting conversation. What an interesting conversation you and I are having and what interesting implications it has for our fashion. I know I've told you this story because we've been friends for a long time, but years ago, I have a massage therapist and I've seen her for 40 years. She's just amazing. So she knows my body really well. And I was having a tough time, especially with my shoulder and she would work on it and she said, it seems okay. And they get it loosened up and it would be okay for a little bit, but maybe just like walking to the car, all of a sudden the shoulder would seize up again. And finally one day she's working on it and we all need friends like this. She goes, if you take that knife out of your back, you'd be fine. And now it's a bit of a shock. I know, but we all need friends like that. But she was right. It was an emotional thing I'd been holding. I felt, when Eric quote, somebody would stabbed me in the back. And I had to deal with that on my own personal level. And it was amazing to me how quickly my shoulder went, yep, okay, let's work on resolving that. It was a contract I had with my shoulder that I didn't even know I had. And I know you teach a skill that we'll talk about, about how to talk to ourselves about it. We've been alluding to unconscious contracts here. Obviously, it was one that I had that until somebody commented on it, I wasn't aware I had it. So many things are flooding my brain in this moment. Just the thoughts, the thoughts of these conversations that we have with ourselves and how we, we use words and the knife in the back and the, the shock of having someone betray us how our body then can hold the shock for some time and these conversations with the cells are are really lovely conversations to begin to have and you and I I think in the past on the show have talked about my discovery of I could talk to my body and there would be less pain but the thing I couldn't change was the pain that I would have with burns and I thought, what, what am I missing with the burns? Maybe burns are different. Maybe they're just so bad that the pain doesn't change in response to being talked to. And then one day I thought about burns and about how with burns, there's an immediate death of some of our fellow cells, the cells that got impacted by the burn. And so when I would get burned on the oven or on a pot or something, I would say, do you need acknowledgement that your fellow cells have died? Is there grief? Is there mourning for the loss of your fellows? And all of a sudden, the pain started to become much less intense. This actually happened to me yesterday. I have a little old cockapoo. She's very sweet. Actually, she's very demonic. But... <laughs> sweet. <laughs> exactly. She's so fluffy. She's just a beautiful, beautiful little black and white dog who's going gray. She's just, just gloriously beautiful. But she gets in the way. And when I'm cooking, she'll come and be right. I, I don't see her because I'm looking up here and she's all the way down there at my feet. And yesterday I was taking a, a pot of boiling water. And I turned to go to the sink and tripped over her and the water splashed and it splashed on my arm and scalded me. And I was like, oh, my God, this is intense. And I'm getting the getting the cold water on there to stop the burning of the water trapped in beneath my my sleeve. And it just and, and I was like talking to myself. I was like, oh, sweethearts, did some of your cells buddies die in there? Are you doing OK? And it. It actually, I, I believe it also speeds healing because there's no, there's no pain there today. And luckily I was luckily 
falling into the sink. So the cockapoo also survived without any harm. <laughs> no animals were harmed in the making of this story. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> One of the things about talking to ourselves, I want you to go through what an unconscious contract is, but sometimes people say, Sharon, that's only talking to myself. And yet I have found how fast, and it may not be a perfect healing. That's not the point. And I'm often saying, what harm does it do to talk to ourselves and be open to the wonder and the glory and the interest and the surprise of I really do feel better now that I've honored myself or myself or some part of me that needed to be felt respected or honored or cared for. So let's talk a little bit about this idea of so where some people are probably hearing that story about, oh, Sarah, maybe it wasn't that bad a burn. I don't think that's the part of the story that is important. <laughs> oh, no. There are a number of things that are interesting about this story. And one of them is, the very first question is, do we feel comfortable being warm with ourselves? Because doing unconscious contract releases, doing resonance for our own cells, talking to them, saying, do you need some acknowledgement that you were hurt? Do you need acknowledgement that you were touched non-consensually? Cells really like that acknowledgement. Sometimes it's just like some stranger we don't know who leans on us in the bus or, or puts a hand on our shoulder and we're like, what the heck? And we get to say to ourselves, you need a little acknowledgement that you don't want to be touched without your consent, that you really like to be able to say yes or no to touch. But getting to that point of being warm with ourselves sometimes takes the release of an unconscious contract that is not a contract with the cells, it's a trauma contract. Because we'll turn away from ourselves when something bad happens. Say there's a car accident, and then there's a lot of pain after the car accident. We don't want to be ourselves. We, we just call ourselves a whiner. We say, Sarah, you're a whiner. You just always think you're in pain. You're just way too sensitive. And we'll just go about our work and our lives as if that pain an injured part doesn't even exist. And then if we have that kind of contract to leave ourselves when we're experiencing pain, then everything that Sharon and I are talking about can be like radically upsetting. It can even make people nauseous that we are talking about being warm with the self. Because if we were warm with ourselves, it would open the door to pain that we have turned away from but maybe we've done enough emotional work that the turning away is not as necessary as it was. The pain is not as scary as it was. The sorrow, the sadness, the shame, the alarmed aloneness, maybe we can actually be with those in a different way now if we release the contract. So we can say, Sarah, I release you from this contract. I revoke this vow. I give you my blessing. The blessing is a lovely and important part of this. I give you my blessing to have warmth for Sarah. I give you my blessing to enjoy her. This is all really radical stuff because in our world, most of the time, we're not supposed to do this. <laughs> it's considered selfish. It's, it goes against uh, the ideas about how to be a good Puritan worker. But happens if we begin to have an exquisite and lovely warmth for ourselves all the time. I love that. And I saw a sign the other day and all it's, this was all it said. And my mind went a hundred different directions and it just, what we are saying right now, just brought it back. It said, tiptoeing is optional. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, dip your toe into the deep end a little bit and just see and how warm and, and wonderful it, it uh, feels and what happens. Being open. I know one of your favorite uh, terms is all about curiosity and I wonder. And I think that's really helpful too. <laughs> we started the conversation talking about fascia and the audience knows we wander off all the time, Sarah. <laughs> The Autoimmune Hour will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by understandingautoimmune.com to learn more. Ohm Times TV. 
Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust, spheric approach. Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Ohm Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Ohm Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk, Walk a, a mile, mile in my shoes. shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse. Walk, Walk a mile in my shoes. <laughs> and I, I want to get back to, to, for people to explore their fascia and understanding how their fascia can be holding these contracts or at least holding up their end of the contract, meaning maybe the contract's not with our fascia, but it's a, a supporting scaffold or structure to the contract. Yeah. I've been thinking about a contract that I have with my fascia or that my fascia has with me as we've been talking. I've been thinking about a way that I immobilize myself and I was thinking, okay, could I, is there something I could do with the way that I get, that I try not to move? And, and is that brace yourself? Is that what's coming? Kind of like a bracing. It's an imposition of immobility. It's a little like bracing, but it's not against something, which a bracing often means there's going to be a blow. And this is not so much about there going to be a blow. This is about, I think this is about having an ADHD brain. So my brain wants to go like 50 million different directions all the time. And so if I keep my body really still, then I can let my brain focus. It's like easier to stay tracking what we've said and haven't said. It's easier to see you it's easier to, to be able to plan what's going to come next if I want to plan anything, if I'm, if I'm immobile. Now, the immobility stops me from breathing and gives me all kinds of aches and pains over the course of a day. And so I've been thinking about this for some time. I've been like, okay, is there any way not to immobilize? And I thought, what if it's a contract? Because we're talking about fashion contracts. And I thought, is it a contract? I, Sarah, solemnly swear to my essential self to, to hang on in order to keep this brain on track instead of letting it go a million directions, <laughs> no matter the cost to myself. And I was like, yeah, that feels really true. Sarah, I release you from this contract. I revoke this vow. And instead, I give you my blessing to... To, to enjoy the million ways that your brain wants to move to, and to f allow a little more spontaneity and to, to yeah, so I hear, I, as I'm feeling into it, I can feel the immobility trying to help me think, to explore thinking without immobilization. <laughs> <laughs> What's so fascinating about this, there? You and I have known each other for decades. That spontaneity of thinking, I think, is one of the most fabulous things about our friendship. <laughs> so let's talk a bit a little about sometimes the positives and honoring those positive parts of us. And then also, could that be also be called just an awareness? Okay, I do know how to buckle down and think, or 
my brain is just one of those fabulous ones that just is constantly coming up with I wonder concepts that everybody else. Is. Wow. Because <laughs> Sarah, one of her gifts is she sees so many obvious things that we don't, that I, like I said, the obvious isn't obvious until commented on. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes Sarah will come to me with the question like, Pasha, and I'll be like, yes, let's <laughs> run with it. <laughs> It's fun, isn't it? Yeah. And I think a lot of our, our listeners will have this experience also of as they begin to work with this circle, oh, these are stories about me not being right or not being good enough, but these are not truths about me not being right or not being good enough. These are just these are just store, old stories, stories from for me, like being in second grade and trying to do arithmetic, just trying to stay focused enough to be able to jump through the school hoops and answer the questions the way the people wanted them to be answered. Five plus three equals eight, not 13. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah. Unconscious contract comes up for me that had an external the consciousness that comes up for me when you said school and things like this. It keeps reoccurring in my mind as it's like the comment that I heard a lot as a child because I was independent. My mother likes to say stubborn. I like to say highly developed ability to stand firm. Um, <laughs> is that comment? And it wasn't my mother's. It usually was a teacher like the who do you think you are kind of comment. Which, gosh, if you just put it on paper, you could take that multiple ways. But it was never said with the intonation of a positive. Right, right. So I'm thinking about these unconscious contracts you said about your mother and the marionette strings. How sometimes it can be like an external thing that we just internalize whether it's true or not. And it can be as vague as who do you think you are? You could think you're a ballet dancer. You could answer that. 500 ways if it wasn't for the intonation that made it in my mind because I can still hear it a derogative thing it reminds me of um and I may not be going in the direction you want me to because I've released the contract and now I'm going everywhere oh (laughs) that's perfect let's run (laughs) reminds me of a friend of mine who talks about the oppression of intelligent girls oh wow that might be another show but you just intrigued Yeah. yeah isn't that a cool naming that it's possible that, that there is like this way that that little little girls who are really smart really can run into some incredible barriers and disruptions. I, I noticed I had that. I noticed I had that that kind of disruption, but I would always feel really confused. And for you, that it was coming from your teacher. When I was a little girl in first and second grade. So often I would feel like I needed to hide that I was smart. But I knew even then and onward, I knew that my classmates actually, unlike many classmates, there was no bullying of my smartness. They liked it that I was smart. They were sweet about it. There was zero pushback on me being smart. But I was, I always felt really scared about being smart. And it was just like last week or last month that I realized that my mom had taken me out of kindergarten and put me in first grade and that she wanted to move me from first grade to second grade. And I had all my little friends in first grade and I didn't want to leave them. So it was like, here's a sort of a different reason not to be smart, not to be separated from the people that you love. So it's so, such an interesting, so there can be so many facets of this kind of oppression of little girls' smartness. How is it for me to be talking about this, Sharon? What happens for you? Oh, I'm totally fascinated. Totally fascinated. And <laughs> I want to take a left turn because we're going to bookmark that one for another show, everybody, because I think it needs to be talked about. And I also see some oppressions with smart children shall I say but I'm totally fascinated by that and I want to take kind of a tangential turn about another thing that I hear a lot in the autoimmune community that I argue with and 
I have no science behind it other than the science of Sharon. But that is the statement that Sharon, your body's attacking itself. Now, mm -hmm. I have a hard problem with that because I know in our times together and all my other 460 plus shows, I've really begun to believe that that's not exactly what's happening with autoimmune. The body is about survival and it wouldn't attack itself unnecessarily. And I don't know the science behind it all, guys, but it just doesn't make sense logically, <laughs> if you think about it, <laughs> evolutionary, that wouldn't make sense. So it's the understanding of these things like responding to traumas, whether physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever, and how we hold our bodies in certain positions to feel like we're protecting ourselves. And then we come to the realization of that point where we no longer need to protect ourselves. And that's where I find a lot of Sarah's work so important is to play in that field of what is still important to me to protect myself and what was really a necessary win and not necessary now because I'm not that same person nor in that same situation or whatever have you. Yeah. And I think that about when it, it wasn't really a protection for you. It was a longing. So it doesn't have to be about a trauma. When Sarah was this one first grade and the longing was, no, I'm happy here. I don't yeah. no, no, I'm fine here. <laughs> this is what really amazes me about it is it doesn't have to be a trauma, big T trauma, little T trauma, none, none of that. That was a perfectly valid need, want, and desire for a six-year-old person. Yeah, yeah absolutely be within their tribe and their community where they felt safe. Yeah. And since we know about the the alarm response, which is happening on the level of the immune cells, like they're getting alarmed and they're trying to mount a defense and they're they're a little confused about where the danger is coming from. And so as we begin to think about immune cells, what kinds of conversations can we have with our immune cells about their commitment to our well-being? And what do they love? Just as you're thinking about the little six-year-old, what does she love? What do our immune cells love? How do they, what kind of support do they need to be able to have the acknowledgement of, of their attempts at love and care. It's interesting. The word that popped into my mind when you said that question was, maybe it's part of myself going, we want respect. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> respect. I don't know why it popped into my mind. There are a lot of our body parts that we just take for granted. Yeah. They've always been there. They've always worked. So let's just keep rolling down the train track, whether it's the right track or not. Let's just keep doing it. That's weird that respect popped into my mind. I love respect. I love, I love also the related word dignity. How does mm. it work? How do they how do your cells like that? Do you want dignity? They like respect better. They like respect better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they do. And it's fascinating because you probably, if you're on video watching us on YouTube, and by the way, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel, Understanding Autoimmune. A little side note there. But it's fascinating if you watch because it really is happening. Maybe you're seeing in the facial expressions where you can see I'm going internal and, and I'm actually hearing this word respect. And then Sarah said dignity. And I'm like, but no, I, I want respect. And I was okay, cool. Now how now my questions are what kind of respect and what does the respect look like to you, immune system? And and what would you what would I be doing and what would you be doing and what would you be feeling and what would I be feeling? And so I mean it just opens up <laughs> some people are going ADHD, but other people are going this floodgates of exploration of <sighs> like, and if you haven't listened to our episode on alarmed aloneness please check it out it's on understandingautoimmune.com or on youtube but it opened up this whole floodgate of back to this idea of skinning stuck in this low level state of alarm which by the way sarah can define it better than me but it's not in rest and digest where your body likes to be or in fight flight or freeze but it's just this low 
sludgy river when I visualize it it's this low sludgy river of stuckness immobilization yeah yeah and that there can be alarmed aloneness that's so intense that it is in the level of fight flight freeze but there can be alarmed aloneness that's so old and we have so much hopelessness and so much resignation about there ever being anybody who will come to us and so we get to get to have a lot of warmth and also respect for our alarmed aloneness and yeah of course you've been feeling that we get to say now would the stuckness of the fascia play into alarmed aloneness i'm just throwing this out guys this is a new question to sarah so but i'm curious if the a lot of the things about fascia is it to protect us and sometimes whether it's cut and then there's scar tissue and things like that and then this contraction that can happen of our fascia that can keep either our whole body locked or parts of our body locked. Um, does the kind of the, if you're stuck in this place of not being able to go to rest and digest, and maybe just in a, maybe that's not a fair word, but in alarmed aloneness, would that help? I'm trying to think which came first, chicken and egg, releasing the fascia or releasing, <laughs> I don't know, sir, where I'm going with the question, but it just bringing up my mind how those two are probably related. Yeah, what a wonderful question. I was thinking, what does our body do with alarmed aloneness? And the initial thing in the big alarm state that we do is we're reaching, we're calling. We're like, where did my loved one go? And then I think the next thing that happens is we start to keep our arms down so that we won't reach so that we won't be because it's embarrassing to reach and have nobody come and it's distressing and stressful and so i think one of the things that may happen with fascial patterns in the front of the body is an immobilization of the arms an immobilization of the shoulder joints and an immobilization also of the back because you when we reach it it starts with our hands moving, but it comes all the way through the shoulder joints and the scapula moving on the back. And, and and there's such a such a movement with reach. So we have to stop the reach in order to be able to survive the alarmed aloneness and not die of metabolic exhaustion. Wow, that is a fascinating to me. We're well, down to just the last nine minutes, so I want to make sure anything that we haven't talked about i want to make sure that you're able to express to us about today's talk about we've gone multiple directions guys but it's all been absolutely fascinating the one thing that came to me just that i didn't quite get to say but i think is really important that's not quite about fascia is just a little thing about depression because depression can be such an experience with with autoimmune stuff the experience of of it having to adjust to our bodies having more pain than we enjoy or uh, more exhaustion than we enjoy. And, and in that, there can be a terrible loneliness. And so part of what can happen with that terrible loneliness is that we can move into depression, which is, and we've talked about this before, but moving into depression means that we don't have to die of metabolic exhaustion. And so then there's like a recovery from depression that starts to happen as our body that gave up begins to reclaim the possibility of hope. And it happens often more by grace than it does by effort, because there's certainly not very much energy from within the depressed state to effort a recovery. So by grace, somehow we stand up and start to move again. And I've been thinking about this a lot lately because I had a period of time where I was really struggling with depression. It was really hard to get out of bed. And I've been in recovery from that period of time. And what I've noticed is I, I got an email yesterday from someone who said, a toolkit for self-compassion. And I thought, this is what our problem is, that we think they're tools and something that we're going to do for self-warmth and self-compassion, when what's really needed is for us to feel warmth for ourselves. And I've started, uh, one of the places where the depression still hung on was in my 
morning and nighttime self-care routines, I would just be like, oh my God, and then I have to brush my hair and then I have to brush my teeth and then I have to be in the shower and then I have to be out of the shower and then I have to dry. And that was just like, it just felt like an unending list of tasks. And all of a sudden last week, I had this wonderful moment where I thought, each of these things, it can be an act of love for myself. And there can be just, it can be just part of a flowing river of love that I step into for my morning experience and for my nighttime experience. So I just wanted to share this with everybody in case it's a meaningful thought, because it was so sweet to me. I didn't want to keep it to myself. That's beautiful. Can I ask an and question? Yeah, of course. Okay. The and question comes up to me, though, of what we've talked about in talking to ourselves and ourselves, C-E-L-L-S, in those moments of checking in with them and finding out if they're on board, if they're okay, what do they need? Well, I've always thought of that as a tool. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is a paradox, right? I mean, it, even it is tell, a paradox. Even me telling this a paradox. Story, <laughs> if, yeah, even me telling this story in the hopes that it has meaning for somebody else and they get to skip a little bit of my own my own slog and struggle is it is a tool doing it in order to reach people. There's there's all these there's all these strategies that we that we have. All right. Yeah. So as we talk to ourselves, and you were talking to yourself, obviously, about turning it into an act of love versus a task, which I love that reframe. It's beautiful. It makes so many of those kind of mundane and really necessary. And as we age, the more we need to do them because the body's less forgiving. <laughs> uh, or maybe not less forgiving that probably not the right word, but I'm thinking physically less forgiving. You have to be a little more moisturizer as I get older every year. <laughs> so I like the reframe of that doing these are an act of love and that it's not selfish and it's not a time waste and that it has to be a priority to keep the body at full full capacity and that how important for me in understanding um, the power of self-love and healing because the body, I have found, doesn't like to play along well if you're not treating it well. And how important, instead of getting upset with your body, why why did my inflammation flare today? Or why did my stomach go off today? Or let's see. I love Sarah's technique of asking, I wonder, or what do you need stomach? Or what do you need knee joint? Or what do you need? I love those types of inquiries into acts of self-love. Yeah, I love them too. I'm glad we get to meet and talk about them and I'm glad people enjoy it. Oh, absolutely. You're our most requested guest. Absolutely. We'll explore the fascia more because we've both been doing fascial release programs. When Sarah and I get together, it's just an open, non-scripted, as you can tell, <laughs> exploration, everyone. But be sure and explore with us more. And I'd love to know in the comments of what your experiences are and how you create self-love for yourself. I think that's the major thing we're walking away with today is how the responsibility for ourselves and taking responsibility and creating our own acts of self-love and and honoring that and being okay with it. And I think that sometimes I hear people say, oh, I'll get to myself. And yet, you know what? One of my comments when I hear that from people, I'll get to myself. You know what? If you're sick in bed with a flare, you can't be doing the things that you're trying to do right now. So put yourself first. Don't mm -hmm. use that phrase as I'll get to myself, because if the body rebels, you'll have a much harder and longer time getting back to whatever it is you need to do. Mm -hmm. So any final thoughts, Sarah? I know we've been all over the board. What are your stories? How are your fascia trying to help you live those stories? Is it possible that those stories are old and outdated? Might you like to let go of some of those contracts that your fascia has with you trying to take care of you? And if it does, what happens? 
everyone that's sarah payton and you can be found at sarahpayton.com p-e-y-t-o-n and just exploring with us today it's been awesome thank you so much sarah i i just love how your mind works i love exploring all these concepts around healing and opening our minds to what healing really means i remember a few years ago i, I had to go see the rheumatologist and i got gotten to that point and they said to me oh, you're doing great. I'm, yeah, I'm doing good. I'm doing great. And it was like, remember, you remember, you're not cured. And I said, yes, but I'm healed. So that's all that matters. <laughs> that's a nice response. I love that. And, and on my website, if you go to sarahpayton.com, there's a button that says start healing now that has all kinds of free meditations, and things to read and look at. Absolutely. And if we've intrigued you at all get her book your resident self i know sometimes my slurring makes it sound like resident it's not it's resonant self and it's all about exploring these ways of talking to ourselves and so go out there enjoy talking to yourself nowadays i when i think about talking to yourself you can just tell people you have your your earbuds in and talk to yourself okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just walk around with your earbuds in nobody will think anything right <laughs> Versus when I was growing up. Totally different to a topic anyway. Everyone, have a great week, whatever your adventures, and join me next week for another brand new episode. And if you're enjoying us on YouTube, be sure and subscribe and hit the little bell for your notifications so you can be notified of every brand new show or clip that we put up. And please let us know in the comments below some of your thoughts about how you talk to yourselves and how your fashion, your body is playing into your well-being and your wellness. So everyone... Thank you for being here on YouTube. We really appreciate your support and keep it going for us. We'd love to grow the community to understand all about healing, being, and wellness. Even if your diagnosis isn't autoimmune, you can still learn from the stuff we share. Have a great week. See you next week. Bye for now. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes.